Thank you, friends, for joining our event. And it's a, it's a controversial topic today uh, because we have Ivan with us and he would be talking about no projects. And even his starting slide itself is quite controversial. And I can see many of, of our attendees are coming from project management background who have been dealing, leading projects, and most of us are BMP certified. And let's see what Ivan has to, to share with us related to no projects. And Ivan, you can start with your introduction and it's over to you. Thank you very much. So for those of you who haven't come across me before, my name is Evan Laybourn. I am an Australian, but currently based out of Singapore. Uh, my focus for the last couple of years has been what we would call business agility, helping for organizations to become an agile organization. It takes the concepts of agility out of IT and applies it to every aspect of an organizational domain, from structure to HR to finance and sales and marketing. In this particular topic, we're looking at project management. Now, the title is rather controversial, and as I say, this is a controversial topic, so please come with an open mind. The tag no projects is by definition uh, a very general statement. I'm not saying or suggesting that projects are entirely useless or that there is in the future no need for projects. But what we will be discussing is the fact that the, the project metaphor that has come to uh, be synonymous with the, the delivery of software products and services is becoming less relevant in an age of continuous, continuous everything from continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, through to continuous feedback and continuous marketing and continuous business. I want to start by helping people understand where I'm coming from, what is a project, and why projects exist the way that they do. So let's just agree on the definition. A, and I'm going to have a cardinal sin of presentation. I'm going to read the slide. A project is a temporary endeavor to govern and deliver a complex change, such as a new product or service. Now, if we agree on that definition, and if anyone disagrees, please chat it now. If we agree on that, then where we take umbrage, where we disagree, is by the definition of a temporary endeavor. I want you to think about the work that you're doing right now. How much of it is temporary? How much of it stops? This is not a bridge where when the bridge is built, the bridge is built. There is no more work done, there's no more development work done on that bridge. The value, the total value of that bridge has been accumulated and now it's a matter of just using it uh, and the difference between the build and the run metaphor. In a software context and in pretty much, I'm guessing, 99% of the work that most of you do, when you finished building you haven't finished building. When you finish the project, it, there is more work to be done, there is more features, there is more value to be created out of that product. And this is kind of the point behind why no projects. I'm going to take a quick break here and just, no one's chatting, all right, let's move on. So, what's wrong with a project, okay? We understand that projects and products live and have a, a life cycle that extends beyond the definition of a project. But what's actually wrong with a project in and of itself? Well, first of all, projects are generally expensive. Now, I define these under the three O's of project costs, overheads, overruns, and opportunity costs. Now, to work backwards, opportunity costs are generally uh, those costs that are incurred by an organization by not doing something the opportunity that was missed because you spent six months delivering a project. Now, Agile actually solves that problem. The whole point of an, of an Agile delivery model is to deliver change incrementally. And so the value is delivered incrementally and the opportunity costs are minimized because you're able to leverage and adapt and, and, and make variation as, as time goes on. 
Overruns and overheads, on the other hand, are something that exists within agile projects as well as within non-agile projects. An overhead is the, is the cost of doing business. It's the cost of a project manager. It's the cost of a scheduler. It's the cost of the project management software. It's the, it's the cost that is borne by doing the work. Now, let's be clear. Just because you're doing a no project style approach doesn't mean that developers suddenly disappear and you can get work for free. The same amount of time is required hands on keyboard to actually code, to deliver something of value. But we can start to reduce some of the other overheads that exist. Overruns are a cost born of poor estimation. We estimate a particular project to take six months or six weeks or six years. It doesn't really matter. Now, that estimate is born out of incorrect or, sorry, insufficient information. And all estimates are based on insufficient information. If you had sufficient information, you would already have completed the project. So when we're talking about an overrun, we're really talking about a failure of estimation. Now, does that mean that the project is bad or that we've done the wrong thing? Not necessarily, and in most cases, no. The amount of time it takes to do something, code a class, create a product, that's the amount of time it was always going to take. The fact that we thought it would take less and we budgeted for less is actually irrelevant. So overruns are a financial construct, but they are a problem endemic to projects because of that temporary nature. And I'll talk a little bit about how we might resolve some of these costs and try and streamline how organizations operate. Another problem with projects is that they fail. And Einstein uh, was quoted as saying, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing and expect a different result. Depending on which study you look at, and trust me, there are a lot of different studies. I can share um, uh, some of that research with you after this if you'd like. But depending on the study you look at, Failure rates of IT projects range anywhere from 40 to 70%. Now, this is, of course, depending on your definition of failure, but generally we would class that as a project that did not achieve their expected result on time, on scope, and on budget. Now, Agile, you would think, well, Agile projects have a lower failure rate, and that is true. Agile projects do tend to have a lower failure rate, partly, I think, because the on scope access starts to disappear because the scope is flexible, but also because of the incremental nature of the work. But even agile fa failure rates are high double digits. We're talking between 30 and 50%, once again, depending on the study that you look at. So if projects keep, if software projects keep failing, why do we keep doing them? Maybe there's another answer. And once again, this is where no projects come in. The third issue that I have with no projects is the fact that they focus on the wrong thing. Projects are a focus on an output. They focus on the throughput of work to achieve a target product. But they're focusing on what you can measure, velocity, lines of code, function points. These are all uh, invalid measures when it comes to value when it comes to business results and outcomes. There is no one in the world in their right mind who is able to say, this velocity will achieve this business outcome. And if only we could increase velocity, we could get more revenue. Uh, because the differentiation and the distinction between work done and value delivered is very, very distant. Right? It, it takes a lot to turn work done into business value, and that's something that is missing in the current project metaphor. So, finally, projects are temporary, and we've, and we've sort of spoken a little bit about this. When you're talking about a project, you're talking about something that ends, but your products don't end. Your products go on maybe not forever, there's a natural end of life, but your product and your product development outlives a project by several orders of magnitude. 
Um, now, some of you might be thinking about DevOps, and let me just have a quick check. No questions so far. Feel free to just send any questions through to the chat. You might be thinking about DevOps, and that's a very good thing to think of. DevOps is definitely a uh, strong uh, approach in order to deliver a continuous stream of work. And in fact, true DevOps and no projects actually are very closely interlinked. In fact, in some cases, they are the same thing. A DevOps team where you join the developers and the operations team, and that they live through the life cycle of a project, product rather than a project, is a no projects model. All right. A lot of organizations still don't quite have that metaphor. They use DevOps more as a way of merging teams and reducing silos and increasing efficiency, but they don't go to that um, to the end case of actually building a product focus. So let me share this diagram with you. This is one of my favorite diagrams. I don't know how well you can see it, but I'll just quickly explain that this is showing the history of project management from 1870 to 2010. Agile is here. Agile began in about the 1980s, 86 for Scrum, uh, and it traces its origin back into Lean coming out about the 1940s. But Agile in itself isn't a project management way of working. Scrum has never said the word project. Scrum is a product delivery method, whereas a project management method is something more like Prince2 um, or a, or a PMP-based model. So let's talk about project management. And back here, Henry Gantt, Henry Gantt, 1870, the Gantt chart, 1910, I think it was 1911. Uh, these concepts have not changed in 100 years. Actually, that's not true. They evolved quite dramatically between about 1900 to about 1950. But from about 1959, 1963, the modern concept of project management hasn't really evolved. Agile has come in, and Agile has um, provided a new way of looking at scope, but what do we do? We take an Agile delivery and we wrap it into a project, and Agile is fairly limited. So al allow me to sort of introduce you to an idea. Let's call it Evan's theory of Agile constraints. The fact that, and with apologies to Elliot Goldratt, a Agile organization is only as agile as its least agile part. Now, how many of you think that the least agile part is your software development team right now? And I'm going to guess that the answer is probably not very many. In most of your organizations, the least agile part is going to be finance or HR or your project management framework. So if we're going to be an agile organization, if we're going to help organizations to be adaptive to market changes and survive the oncoming storm, which is the startups and the fintechs and the um, innovation that's coming out of all of these new modern companies, then we need to be adaptable. And the project management framework, as it currently stands for most organizations, is anything but. So. There's the history of projects. I'll pause here to ask if anybody has any questions, either over Twitter or over chat. And I don't think there is, so if you don't mind, I will move on. So, introducing no projects. So, what do I mean by no projects? So, oops, there we go. It is effectively continuous change. It is the idea that there is no end, or more rather that there is a natural end of life to a product, but that change is a, is a natural state of that product up until its natural end of life. And we can wrap any sort of um, uh, process around that from lean to project management, uh, sorry, to product management rather than project management, um, and of course our good old Scrum and Kanban models. But as long as we have this idea that change doesn't stop, then the metaphor of a project becomes less relevant. So 
Once again, the cardinal sin of presentations, I'm going to read from the slide. Why? Because it's critically important that you understand this. This is the definition of no projects. Oh, sorry, this is my definition of no projects. There are others who will have slightly different views, but the intent is still much the same. The alignment of activities, and that is work that you are undertaking, to outcomes, and these are business outcomes, not technology outcomes. An outcome might be revenue, or it might be user growth. An outcome isn't, I delivered this product. Measured by value. Now, everything that you do should, theoretically, add some value to the wider business result. It is constrained by guiding principles. Right? These principles are stop teams and organizations from descending into chaos. Principles might be all work must apply to uh, must comply with the organization's brand guidelines. So a principle might incur an additional cost, but it does ensure that people aren't working across purposes. And optionally, supported by continuous delivery technologies. I say optionally, even though it's not on the slide there, because it's not mandatory. You can have no projects without having supporting technologies. You don't need to have continuous integration and continuous delivery, but it greatly helps. The, one of the reasons Agile became possible in the 1980s through to, um, to 1990s is the fact that the cost of change in a software context reduced quite dramatically. And it's unlike a bridge where the once that concrete starts pouring, the cost of change is astronomically high. You've got to break out the sledgehammers and start ripping apart what's being done. An agile product, on the other hand, or even an agile project, the cost of change is relatively low. A couple of days work, and you've refactored and re-engineered whatever either mistake or new direction that you've chosen to take. The continuous delivery technologies extend on this. They further reduce the cost of change so that you no longer need to have complex change advisory boards or um, deployment uh, or manual deployment processes so that our uh, so that if there is a change, if there is a continuous stream of change, there's not a continuous cost incurred in implementing each of those changes or at least deploying each of those changes. You still have to actually write the code. So, whilst it is optional, it is highly recommended in order to make this effective for an organization. Now, some of you might say, oh, but we can't do this in our organization, and I challenge you. I say that you're wrong. I say that pretty much most organizations are able to start going down this path. If we can do continuous delivery and DevOps in mainframe environments, um, which are about as legacy as legacy gets, we can pretty much do it in any environment. And whilst there are exceptions, there are cases where projects make sense and continuous delivery um, uh, is difficult or if not, uh, not cost effective, I, I would argue that in the majority of cases, it is necessary. So, why? Why are we doing this? And I want to introduce you to a concept called the continuous culture. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but this is really where the value in an organization is generated. And I don't like the term, but let's talk about millennials, right? The generation 1981 through to today. Millennials are seen as a fickle organization, uh, a fickle generation interested in jumping from one thing to another. Now, whilst that's a stereotype, there's a certain validity to that statement. There's a certain context in which, yes, people are expecting more, and not just millennials. Our entire culture is now getting to the point where we change our mobile phone more often than we change our hairstyle. Uh, we are continuously changing what, and, and our expectations that come from uh, our uh, the organizations that we buy from is increasing. I don't know about you, but if I go to a banking website, for example, and I see that their internet banking uh, page hasn't changed in the last, uh, say, two years, I'm probably going to be a little bit skeptical about are they going to be the right people for me to, to work with. 
Now, they may have perfectly good banking services and there may be absolutely nothing wrong with them. But there's a perception. There's a perception that if they're not changing, if they're not innovating, then they're not doing the right thing. And this culture, even if you are working in, an, in a traditional area where there's not usually a lot of change, this culture is going to hit you sooner than you think. The expectation from everybody, and even in a B2B situation where you're working with clients rather than consumers, even in that situation, there is hundreds of people expecting continuous change. Your clients are going to be expecting you to evolve and adapt with them, and if you don't provide them with something of value, then they won't be your clients for very much longer. Now, let me pause there for a moment and see if anyone had any questions to add to the chat. Uh, it doesn't look like it, so let me move on to the next part. Where to begin? What is the value and of no projects and how do you actually start to deliver that value? So, the first thing you need to understand is what is an outcome? Right. And we have to understand that an outcome is something that improves a business, a business result. Now, your organizational KPIs are technically outcomes. They may not be good KPIs, you may not necessarily agree with them all, but they are an outcome that is trying to occur. So an outcome is something that we set, it doesn't change very often, Revenue. T it's, it's an outcome might be a increase in revenue, an increase in users. It might be staff satisfaction, customer satisfaction. All of these are improvements to the way that the business, or to the existence of the business. Now, the target will change, and the target might change from month to month, quarter to quarter, year to year, but the fact of the outcome is probably not going to change very often. So, in a land of in unpredictability and instability, we're able to say this outcome is relatively stable. We, if we focus our attention on the business and the business objective, then we probably can't go wrong. Well, I'm sure we can go wrong in lots of different ways, but the theory <laughs> is still sound. This is something that I call an outcome profile. Now, an outcome profile is something that uh, organizations can use, and these are very, very simple, by the way. This is from a startup that I, that I mentor. Um, they define the objectives of the business. Think of these as extended KPIs. All right? so, so for this, uh, for this startup, all right, they want to increase active subscribers, and they want to increase staff satisfaction. Both of those are good. You'll notice that active subscribers, obviously, they have zero subscribers at the moment, and they want to have their target is 10,000 subscribers in three months. Now, that might change, right? That might, um, they might decide that they want 100,000 or 1,000, depending on the context. But the outcome of increasing subscribers is still valid. Now, interestingly, if you look at staff satisfaction, the target is actually a reduction. They have 100% retention, and they want to target 95% retention over a 12-month period. Now, their rationale behind that is 100% is unsustainable. They're a small startup. They're going to grow in staff. They expect to have churn. They expect to have people leave them. That makes sense. So they have set themselves a, a, a target. Now, you'll notice also that the target is an indicator of staff satisfaction. Staff satisfaction as an outcome, as a business outcome, could be measured by a satisfaction survey. Right? You walk out the doors of the office and you press a smiley face or a sad face. For those of you who are agilists, it could be mood marbles and so forth. But the target, we use an in indicative target, which is staff retention. So we apparently have a few questions. Uh, oh, hang on, there we go. Da, da, da. Ivan, if you want, I can read them if you're finding it difficult. If you could, that would be good. Okay, so uh, they, they are like a bit uh, generic uh, uh, in nature. So uh, the first question came is that in outsourcing vendor, 
uh, it's difficult to imagine a situation without projects because they need to deliver something against something, projects. Yes, so, and there's a concept which allow me to jump ahead very quickly. Oops. And unfortunately, it's not here. Okay, sorry, it, it, I thought this slide was in this deck and it's not. There's a concept that I call the um, trust pyramid. At the bottom of the and, and this is the and this describes the trust between a vendor and a and an organization. At the bottom is reference-based trust. Then comes contract trust. Now, contract trust is where most vendor relationships stop. Right? The vendor and the client trust each other because there's a contract in between them. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's very hard to be agile, let alone have a continuous delivery model, if the only trust that your customer has with you is based on a contract, because a contract has to be watertight. But trust goes beyond that. We go into identification-based trust, where they trust you because they have experience with you. And then partnership, or partnership-based trust, where your success is, or failure is mutually assured. Right? You are. Uh, you can only succeed or fail together. Now, what does this mean in terms of something like no projects, or for that matter, just plain agile? It means that as a vendor, you have to work with your client to go one step up on that trust pyramid. You need to go to identification-based trust or preferably partnership-based trust. And the client has to be able to trust you to continuously improve their products. Now, from a contractual perspective, there are different ways that this can be done. You can have outcome-based contracts, power by the hour. Um, you can have performance bonuses if certain business objectives are met. Um, you can even structure it just purely around time and materials if, if that's necessary. But understand that this only works if the client trusts you. What was the next question? Yeah, so the next question which I'm picking out of this uh, list of questions is that how is it different from uh, Kanban? Because Kanban also talks about doing continuous flow of, of work. So how no projects is different from the Kanban? Um, Kanban, which talks about a particular flow of work is a, it comes out of lean, for those of you who, uh, uh, who don't know. So it's very much about a singular process flow. You look at a, a, you look at a process, you do a value stream map of that process, and that value stream map can turn into a Kanban board that work flows through. What I've got up on the board here is what we call a activity canvas. This is technically by definition a Kanban because each of those activities on that canvas flows through a particular set of states. It is a signboard, a card wall, if you will. So if you are using Kanban without using a project wrapper and that you have a development team and a maintenance team who are on the same Kanban board and that you have a continuous flow that lasts for multiple years, then you are talking about no projects. You are talking the very much the same thing. But if you're using, if you have a six-month engaged project, it is a dedicated team, and they are using Kanban to track the flow of work within that project, which is a perfectly legitimate use of um, Kanban. Then you're not doing no projects. So Kanban is a tool, a mechanism. Um, as well as a way of working, um, but which is complementary to something like no projects and the value delivery, the continuous value delivery way of thinking, but it is not exclusive. What was the next question? Any more questions? We have a one more question before nope. we move forward. Right. Uh, so this one is uh, talking about the team is delivering values by delivering user stories, so the uh, uh, high prioritized user stories, uh, but it may not result into the business value or outcome. So how, how because the business outcome is, is dependent on various other reasons which, are, which could be beyond the control of the team. So how do you address that part when you talk about measurement of outcomes? Okay, so that's actually the very next thing I'm going to talk about. So the outcome profile gives you a target. 
that you are, um, are trying to achieve. Right? So you're going to do work, lots and lots and lots of different work. Now, I'll talk about how we actually measure that in a second, but measure it we do. And so if our target, for example, is a um, uh, one, uh, 10,000 new subscribers, then every X day, week, month, whatever duration makes sense, all right, you will measure that outcome. So each individual user story has an immeasurable, unmeasurable, insignificant impact on value. Now that may not always be true, right, in that there may be some very, 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 very high value stories, but when it comes to a business result, the the, the value tends to be very, very small and unmeasurable. So we don't, we're not interested in measuring the value of a story. We're interested in measuring the value of the flow, the, the stories that are being completed in that time, in that, let's say it's a week, let's say it's a month, and has it made a meaningful, measurable change, delta, to that particular outcome. Now, it may be negative, and there's actually four things you need to understand when it comes to measuring value. The first thing is value degrades. If you do work and then stop, the value that that work has produced will actually start to go down. All right? And this is one of the problems with, um, it, think of it in terms of entropy of value. It's, you could run a project, but then within six months, the actual business value that's been generated by the work that's been done by that project will start to degrade, and you have to do another project to pick it back up again. When we do, work on valuable tasks. Sometimes we actually work on low value activities before the high value activities, technical dependencies. And so when we do measure the outcome, there needs to be a level of common sense to say that, look, we're only six weeks in to this brand new product or this new way of working. We're doing foundational work. There will be no material change to that outcome. The other thing to understand is there's a concept called local maxima. Now, this happens when no matter how much more effort, no matter how many more user stories you do, you're not changing the outcome or the target for that outcome. So I can add feature after feature after feature, but I'm not getting any more subscribers. I, I'm stuck at 10,000. I'm not getting to 20,000. Nothing I add is actually making a difference. So sometimes you actually have to reduce value, all right? Try a different approach. Come down off that hill where you've hit your maximum value so that you can go up again. And good examples are things like Microsoft Office. They regularly rip out functionality because it overloads and confuses users and, and reduce, and they hit their value maxima. So they rip out functionality, and they go up again from the new slightly lower point. And that's actually quite important to understand in that value does not is not a single trajectory. Sometimes it does go down, and that's a good thing, as long as it then obviously goes back up. The last one that I want to call out is what I call the so what factor. Uh, you'll have a lot of user stories, and each and the business might think it's high value. Right? It's going to end in a lot of different users. So always ask so what to every user story that comes up. So what? If I didn't do this story, what would happen? And sometimes you'll find that our own personal biases actually influence and, and fundamentally change our uh, perception of what's important, of what's valuable. And so by changing the question slightly, we're sometimes able to, add, um, to look at the value a little bit better and make better judgments. So I hope that answers all your questions. Feel free to add a couple more. I'll go through a few more points, and then we'll stop again for any more questions. So before I leave the topic of outcomes, I wanted to introduce a concept of working principles or constraints. These are particular aspects of the product development flow or stream or the outcome team that is common across every single team, product, even project if you have those as well. 
and these enforce a level of standardization. But you have to understand that every constraint, every principle that you put in place, fundamentally has a cost associated with it. If I allow any team to do anything they want in any way they want, then my costs are going to be relatively low. It's one of the reasons startups actually are, um, can be quite cheap to begin, because they have very little uh, uh, legacy cost that's involved in creating or changing something. For anyone who's been a software developer, you know that you can write 70% of an application in the same time it takes you to write the last 20%. Right? It, it, it's, it's, the more complicated something gets, the longer it's going to take. So, but we put in place working principles because they're important. And if we have one team, we don't need principles, we just work collaboratively. If we have 10 teams, we need to make sure that team A and the outcome that they are accountable for does not conflict with team B and the outcome that they are accountable for. So for example, I mentioned earlier branding. All external facing systems must use corporate branding. Now that will add a small cost to any external facing system, but it is important that that happens. Now, those of you who have uh, are developers have probably come across the Moscow rating. Must have, should have, could have, won't have. Now, I actually use the Moscow rating to apply to principles and constraints. Some principles, some constraints are must have. You are not allowed to break that constraint. All right. Um, for example, all external facing things must have a security penetration test performed every three weeks. I don't know. All right. It's security. It must be done. Yes, we acknowledge that they will introduce a cost to everything that we do, but it's a cost that we're willing to pay. Should have is if you don't want to do it, you need to have a good reason and a justifiable reason, but you don't have to. So the brand example is a should have. And if I'm doing a mobile application, I may not be able to comply with the brand guide, the, the company brand guidelines, in which case I sh I Having it as a must is is is, uh, is is too much. Could have uh, guidelines or principles which follow them if they do not incur a significant cost, and of course, won't are principles that we avoid where possible. I hope that makes sense. Um, the final thing I want to talk about is organizational structure. Now. For those of you who uh, know me will know that I talk a lot about org design. How do you build an agile company? And a lot of that comes down from collaboration, and a lot of it comes down to structurally enabling agility. And no projects is no different. If you're going to have a continuous flow of work, then you need to reduce the overheads and the silos that exist. You can't be handing your development work, uh, sorry, the, the, the product from a development uh, team to a test team to a deployment team and so on and so forth because every handover, every new team will have their own flow, their own backlog, and fundamentally this continuous culture is going to be broken. The more cross-functional you can make a team, all right. Start to introduce accountants, HR professionals, sales and marketing people. The more people that, and the more skill sets you bring into a team, the more they are self. Oh, sorry. The more they are independent, self-reliant, and the faster you can actually deliver a continuous stream of work. And this is the other reason we use principles: is, is if we have a very truly cross-functional team, then we are able to have this this conversation, this flow, um, in a very quick, very reasonable way. So, before I move on to part four, are there any other questions? Take it at the end, so uh, we have just one, so let's move. No, ask the question, I'll take it now. Okay, so this question was uh, a generic, so uh, it, is, uh, it is asking that uh, when we write the good user stories, uh, what is the possibility of not having value if we write it in a proper format, we use, if we do use oh. as ABC, then it should have a business value. Um, very high. So user stories aren't always purely 
business focused. It, it's it's and, and it, you you can have user stories that are uh, let's call them technical debt. So you, you will have technical debt in that backlog. Now technical debt isn't technically a user story um, and it does have a different form but it's still work that you need to do and that and technical debt by definition doesn't have business value. The other thing is that uh, just because you have a well-formed user story as a software developer I need to be able to automatically compile all my work um, every time I commit so that I know if I break the build. All right, that's a good, well-formed user story. Now, I know I can justify in advance the value of that piece of work. Not quantify, all right? Quantify is a different matter, but I can justify it. I can say we're doing this because here's the reason. But the problem is we cannot guarantee that this piece of work will actually achieve the business return that we are expecting. Right. As a job seeker, I would like to X, Y, Z so that I can find a job. All right. Now, great, all right. Theoretically, if we introduce this feature, then we should get more job seekers. We should get more users into our system. But maybe we can't. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe we create the feature and there is no measurable impact to the um, uh, to the business outcome. So it's in the first instance you can have technical stories, technical debt which do not add a value and secondly a well-formed user story is no guarantee of a material um, uh, benefit. Okay, moving on to part four. So this is where, so the person who asked the conversation about Kanban, right, this is in many ways Kanban. Right? But I'm going to give you a slightly different way of looking at it. So I want to introduce you this concept of an activity canvas. Now, when we talk about no projects, everything that we do is an activity. An activity is measured by value. It, it does create value. And that value will achieve one or more, uh, oh, sorry, will work towards one or more outcomes. And so it's actually possible to have a user story that improves two outcomes, not just one outcome. And that's just a bonus. So this is an activity canvas. It, it, it's not overly complicated. What we're seeing is a, uh, is a, uh, bivari a bivariant chart. It's looking at business value versus effort. And so what we're trying to say is in our top left, our high value, low effort, activities, this is what we should do first because theoretically that's the best way in which we can actually um, deliver the maximum value. And those that are in the limit and the defer quadrants, we can get to them but not necessarily straight away. We should do what's in the, in the first quadrant first before we get to limit and defer. Now you'll notice that at the very, very bottom left Zero effort, zero value is the status quo. The current organization as it currently stands is zero, zero. It takes no effort to keep it at that, and it takes no effort, uh, and there's no, but there's no new value to be generated by keeping at the status quo. Right? If we load the activity canvas with, with different ideas, and once again, this is from a, a startup just to give you some ideas of what this could um, look like, then these are all independent activities. So let's, these are user stories. These might be bigger than a standard user stories. These might be epics. It depends on the context in which you operate. Right? But the, um, uh, the effect is still the same. Those of you who are uh, familiar with the INVEST acronym, this applies here. INVEST, independent, negotiable, valuable, estimatable, small, or scalable, depending on which one you read, and testable. I just had to remember that off the top of my head. So the key here is independence. Each of these, each story, each epic should be independent. If I remove it from the board, it should have negligible impact on any other story. Now, pragmatically and realistically, we know that that's not always possible. Right? There are always going to be cases where something of lower value or higher effort must be done 
before another activity, before another user story, before another epic. Now, this is the pragmatic reality. We're not able to work on just low effort, high value stuff. Uh, when we're starting out, we've got to get the database installed. All right? We've got to get the server set up. Now, there's no business value in setting up a server. There's no business value in setting up the, um, uh, the database. It must be done in order to enable business value to be created by the future activities. Right? And they may even be highly complex, high effort activities, but they must be done first. And so whilst our activity canvas, we should be operating from top left to bottom right, right? sometimes we will start somewhere in the middle and then once we get those uh, dependent activities complete, we can move on and do something else. I want to then touch on some of the technology of no projects. Now, this is the technology of DevOps, for those of you who are familiar with, with DevOps ways of working. All right? Automated testing, continuous integration. All right? These are, uh, there's nothing new about this. CI has been around for decades. Uh, I, would, I haven't written a line of code for more than 10 years uh, for pay. I, I write code as a, for fun because I'm a sucker for punishment. Um, but uh, my job hasn't been to write code for, for over 10 years. I was doing automated unit testing and continuous integration back in 2003. So these are not new ideas. And yet I see company after company who still struggle with the, con uh, with, with, the, with, with the idea. They're doing unit testing in Excel. Now, it's, the shameful fact is if you don't have your software craftsmanship in place, if you don't have your technical competence in place, and I don't mean you have to be masters, I don't mean that you have to be the 10x developers, but you have to know the basics and have the hygiene in place no amount of improvement of your uh, delivery process, no amount of improvement of moving away from projects and moving towards outcomes or moving towards products is going to improve anything. All right? Get your hygiene factors in place. Get automated unit testing in place. Get continuous integration in place. Now, CD, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, and DevOps, these are a little bit newer. All right? These weren't around in any strong wrong way uh, back in 2003. Right? Um, these, are, the, these are concepts which have sort of really emerged in the last sort of five or six years. But even those are, there's a lot of material out there. Do you need continuous delivery in order to do no projects? No. You can very easily run a no projects and still manually deploy. It does mean that every time you deploy, there's a cost to it, which is why if you don't have continuous delivery, you would tend to batch your releases. Right? So you don't release every sprint, you release every three sprints or four sprints. Right? If, you, if you have a simple enough deployment process, just asking to production, then okay, you might be able to do it. Um, but in, in most cases, in most larger organizations, the deployment process runs at a, um, uh, 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 there's a, sorry, I've forgotten the word. Um, there's a latency between doing the work and uh, deploying it. Now, if there's a, the longer the latency, the longer it takes to realize the benefits. Right? And you have to understand that in a no projects, we're talking continuous culture. People are expecting change. They're expecting continuous improvement. So we should be looking at things like continuous delivery and DevOps to enable that as well. I say it's optional, but it is strongly recommended. So the last thing I want to talk about and that is, and, and please don't hang up now. I know I'm about to talk about finance and the finance part, the boring part, but this is actually the critical part. Most organizations, when they go, you know what, we're going to try a product-based delivery or an outcome-based teams or value delivery teams or no projects, come across the one problem, and that is finance says, where's your project code? All right, give me your business case. Give me your qualified benefits. Even in an agile project where the scope is unfixed, you still have to do a budget 18 months in advance for a scope that you don't even know what it's going to do at that point in time. You may have a vague idea, but they're asking you to quantify 
a the benefits of a project, an agile project, where the scope is going to change week to week, all right, or sprint to sprint. So we have to ch start changing the question. And, and this is actually, I want you to, if you take nothing else away from this talk, from this webinar, take this away. Right? The question isn't, how much will this cost? Because how much will this cost is a project question. It is a question that has an answer because it has an end. And if I'm building a bridge, it's a legitimate question because that bridge will be done at a certain point. And how much does it cost has a certain threshold. It will be it will cost five million dollars because it will be done on the 27th of January 2017. And here's our architectural diagrams. In a software context, when we're building a product, it's not how much does it cost, but how much is this worth? And if you can add, and and as a delivery team, you don't answer the question. You ask the question: How much is it worth? How much is it worth to the organization if we deliver this product? Maybe it's worth $10 million in revenue. Great, okay. We will, like, how much are you willing to pay to get $10 million in revenue? Maybe $3 million, okay. Our team size is now $3 million worth of people per year. That's what the, that's the finance question. That's what it's going to cost. It's going to cost $3 million per year because we're going to set up a team of size X, however many people it takes to burn through $3 million, and they're going to be set up in such a way as to deliver value, and we're going to measure it. And if after a month we're not delivering a quantum, a measurable amount of value, if after three months or four months or five months we're not delivering the measurable value, we can actually have another conversation. The question is, you thought it was worth 10 million. At current projections, it's only going to be worth five. Do you want to continue? And they can make a call. They can decide, yes, we want to continue, or you know what? Actually, let's not continue at the full burn. Let's drop it down to 1.5 or 2 million spend in order to achieve a $5 million return. And I know this is the boring part of the conversation. I know this is the boring part of the webinar. But if you don't have this conversation, if you if you if you don't know how to have this conversation, then you're going to be stuck being a cost center. You're going to be stuck being delivering widgets that will cost X, and you'll be unable to have that continuous flow, and you will not meet your customers' expectations because your customers' expectations are changing, and finance needs to change to keep up. That's the end of the main presentation. I've got about five minutes left. Are there any final questions? Uh, so there is a one uh, question which is talking about uh, without measuring the variance between estimated and actual in terms of productivity, how can we learn from our endeavor to become more productive and more efficient, uh, whatever we use, be projects or not, no projects? Okay. So that's a misnomer. So what, I'm uh, sorry, give me a second to collect my thoughts. Productivity, no, efficiency is a poor measure. If I do the wrong thing really efficiently, is that good? No, it's not. So it's, it's I can be inefficient as long as I'm adding value at a greater rate than I'm spending. All right? Now, obviously, if I'm adding value, but it's costing me more to add value than it is to deliver it, then we have a problem. Then we need to look at efficiency. Then we need to look at um, productivity. All right? But if I'm adding, if I continue to add value, then yes, I should be aiming to get better. I should be aiming to be more productive. And by human nature, the more I do something, the more I learn from it, the more productive I get. But efficiency for efficiency's sake is the wrong measure. It's the project measure. It's the um, looking at what is measurable rather than what is valuable. There's also a second point to that question, and, and, the, and this is where the misnomer is. And you said comparing estimates to actuals. That doesn't tell you how productive you are. All that tells you is how good your estimation is. 
if you want to know how productive you are, don't look at estimation. Look at return on investment. Look at um, uh, 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 the delta of velocity. All right? Is your velocity increasing in a meaningful way rather than a game of, uh, rather than a games way? All right? But don't just go. Oh, look, we are more. We are closer to our estimates. Therefore, we must be doing better. Yes, you're getting better at estimation, but that tells me absolutely nothing about whether you are actually delivering business value. So uh, the follow-up question which came from two people uh, primarily talking about that uh, do we have some measurement metrics at team growth level because we might be hitting value maxima where we don't see an impact of our activities on, on value generation but what is, what's an alternative? So what can we look at and, and, and find out that how team is growing? Okay, so there's sort of two questions there. One is about team performance and one is about the local maxima and, and they're a little bit different. So let me take the team performance one um, uh, to begin with. So team performance is a legitimate question. Now, um, what we don't want is to be measuring teams on the wrong thing. All right, so most agilists know that measuring on velocity is is bad right because if you measure on velocity you can easily gain that and it and it promotes the wrong behavior so when we look at team performance we're looking at things such as defect injection rates how the quality of the work that they do we're looking at things like um, velocity variance so velocity should be um, uh, either slowly increasing or relatively stable all right, so we, 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 don't, we want a fairly low velocity variance. The other measure that we can use quite effectively is actually, um, uh, I say return on investment because people understand it, that was technically not ROI, where we can look at the business value delivered per sprint. And so if, if each of those user stories and their value points, let's say, it's, it's 20 value points sprint one, 21 value points sprint two, 15 value points sprint three. And so if we can see that, that we are constantly increasing our value delivery, but better still, our the ratio of our effort to value, and so just simply dividing the story points by value points um, and turning that into a ratio, it's not quite as simple, that's a good measure because we're actually showing that not only are we getting a little bit better, but we're also delivering value positively. We're not costing more than we deliver. To the second question, which is about local maxima, that's more about creativity than it is about performance. If you're finding that you're on a local maxima and that you're not adding value in any meaningful way with all the user stories that you're delivering, you actually, it's better to stop at that point get the right people in the room, the, get the users in the room, get the customers in the room and, 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 and the product owners and, and actually have a conversation about what can we change, not, can we, not what can we add, what can we do more, but what can we fundamentally change to improve whatever the outcome is, the number of users or subscribers and so forth. And that's a creative activity rather than a development activity. That's where we're thinking about new ways of working, new ways of, or new things to deliver in order to, well, maybe, maybe we have to delete half a dozen features from the system in order to rebuild something else. So we may have to drop in value, but the idea is to go back up a different curve. Great. Uh, thank you, Ivan. I think this is what we have time for. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, your thoughts about no projects. It was very insightful webinar. I was going to say it's an absolute pleasure, thank you. Uh, and if anyone listening wants to get in contact with me, they can email me, tweet at me, or connect with me on LinkedIn. So, And all of these slides are up on SlideShare. Um, they're welcome to download that. If they have further questions about this, just send me a LinkedIn message, send, um, tweet me, and I'll share with you all the information that I'm doing. I'm actually writing a book on this topic right now, uh, which will be out by the end of the year, and um, uh, I've got about 30 case studies that we're collecting from around the world. So if anyone's really interested in seeing who's doing it, banks and organizations who are, who are actually doing this right now, tweet me, LinkedIn, message me, and, we'll, um, and I can share some of the early case studies that we're collecting for the book. Great. Thank you.
thanks for joining and thanks everyone again for for sharing your thoughts on our projects and thank you everyone else for listening in